welcome to the Out of the Woods Growing Income from Your Forest webinar. This evening, we have Abby Vandenberg, a research associate professor from Proctor Maple Research Center. Much of Abby's research focuses on the ecophysiology of maple sugaring, including the effects of tapping and carbohydrate extraction on tree growth and health, the physiology of stem pressure and carbohydrates in xylem sap, and ultimately on helping to develop management practices and tapping guidelines to ensure the long-term sustainability of maple syrup production. Recently, her work has expanded to include studying the physiology of stem pressure development in birch trees and investigating sap yields and the potentially potential profitability of adding birch syrup production to existing maple operations in the northeastern U.S. My name is Lindsay Kazarek and I will be your co-host this evening along with Kate Fotos who is helping run controls and field questions in the chat and Q&A which are open this evening. So if anyone has questions during the presentation please feel free to pop those in there, you can find those at the bottom of your screen. So without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to Abby Vandenberg. Oh, Abby, you're muted. All right, let's start that over again. Thank you all very much for, thank you, Lindsay, for uh, having me and that really nice introduction. And thank you all for being here to hang out and talk about Red Maple tonight. Hopefully it'll be a little bit, a little bit fun and hope we learn something new. Um, so I'm just gonna get right into it. Um, and thank you for reminding me to unmute myself. This is off to a great start, okay. So we're going to talk about not just uh, yields, but also the flavors of red maple trees uh, and some uh, the results of recent experiments that we have recently completed. So the big question here, and I love this uh, photo. This is from a former researcher um, in an area of interest of mine. I used, uh, used to study the anthocyanin formation in sugar maple. Um, and this is something that one of my fellow researchers in that area did um, to induce anthocyanins, which are red pigments that are found in many plants. And uh, it, we were all studying the question of why red. And so I'm able to borrow that for this other context, why red maple? And there are a lot of reasons to consider red maple for a crop tree or as a crop tree in maple syrup production either considering it for the first time or considering it more seriously perhaps than uh, it, it's been, than you have considered it before. Um, one of those reasons is simply that there are a lot of red maples within the maple re uh, producing region of the US and Canada. Um, on the left here is the native range of sugar maple, but you can see that the, there's an even broader range of red maple, and it actually extends into regions more south and west than um, some of our sugar maple, into regions that can still produce maple syrup, but don't have the, um, don't necessarily have the abundance of sugar maple also. And one of the reasons for this immense range of red maple is that it is a species that is incredibly competitive on a super wide variety of sites. So it can compete well on sites that are, you know, as wet as swamps, like sort of like this one, which is like almost got its feet in the water here. You can find them in swamps, you can find them on dry ridges and everywhere, every type of site in between. They're extremely adaptable. Um, and that makes them able to grow in a whole lot of different environments. And it's partly why we see them in this much broader, uh, much broader geographic range. Um, and Owing in part to that, we see a lot of red maple and potential red maple taps as crop trees throughout the maple producing regions of the US and Canada. And this is from a study that my colleague, Dr. Mike Farrell did a few years ago, looking at the number of potentially potential crop trees, potential taps 
in states across the United States, um, in the maple producing region, the commercial and a little beyond the commercial or the historically commercial maple producing regions of the US. And I just have a few of these highlighted here. He was looking at both sugar maple and red maple, but you can see that in many states um, all over the United States, there is an abundant resource of red maples to be tapped and oftentimes, it's even bigger than the sugar maple resource to be tapped. So obviously places like Kentucky, we might think that that's kind of a no brainer, but places like New Hampshire have a much more abundant resource of sugar maple or red maples than they do sugar maple, which is kind of fascinating. And just again, shows that there's a lot of potential red maple to be um, brought in to maple production, either in existing stands that are already being used for maple production or stands that have yet to be uh, exploited for maple, uh, maple syrup production. So, and a huge reason that red maple is important to consider is that it is something, it's a species that adds diversity and therefore resilience to our sugar bushes as they are. So, Anytime we can increase the species diversity, both in trees and also in all other types of species, but just looking at trees for as an example, anytime that we increase the diversity of species in our forest and especially in our sugar bushes, it's going to increase their ability to re be resilient and respond to stress and basically um, experience stresses and adverse events and recover from them and maintain longevity. And this is a great example that my colleague, um, UVM's maple extension specialist and program leader, Mark Iselhart, took a few years ago when we had a forest tent caterpillar outbreak in uh, parts of Vermont. This is a native pest, uh, but we have, it's cyclical. So in years where it's very abundant, it can be very damaging and very, um, have be very impactful in sugar bushes. But interestingly enough, it feeds in, in the genus Acer, it feeds predominantly on sugar maple. And so you can see here in this picture that he took that you have a sugar maple that's been completely defoliated by the forest tent caterpillar and growing right beside it are untouched red maples. And so you can imagine in a stand where you have only sugar maples as your crop trees, if you had a year or two of forest tent caterpillar, this could be very um, impactful on the health of the uh, forest overall, as well as potentially on production. So having those red maples in addition to the sugar maples uh, really adds the ability of that uh, sugar bush itself to be resilient to that kind of stress. So that's a hugely important reason to consider adding red maple as a crop tree or keeping it. And the other big, big picture reason is that sort of owing in part to the things that make it so adaptable and able to grow on all these different sites, because of that, because of that plasticity and adaptability, red maple is predicted to do pretty well in terms of its abundance uh, in, respo in response to the changing climate that is predicted to happen. So the warming and also shifting climate regimes that are predicted to happen pretty much in every model that's out there, red maple increases in abundance in the areas of traditional maple syrup production. So um, if you don't love it now, it is definitely going to be a bigger and bigger part of maple production as we go forward in the future, as it becomes more and more abundant. Um, it is better adapted, it's better adapted. Uh, it will, is predicted to do better in these areas than sugar maple will. Okay. So that's the case for why red maple. And so the obvious question is, well, why not? Um, and so one of the reasons we started this work was because there were still existing some really lingering preconceptions or perceptions about red maple as sort of a less than a, a species for maple production, like somehow inferior to sugar maple. And these were beliefs like that, you know, some of them may have had some foundation in some reality, uh, lower sap sugar content, but also a belief that that might lead to lower overall total yields in sugar maple. Um, and then some of them had to do, uh, a lot of them have to do with its flavor. Um, in particular, that the red, ma red maple sap turns buddy, uh, produces buddy syrup earlier than sugar maple. 
and that maybe the flavor is somehow different or inferior. <clears throat> and really when it comes down to it, especially now with modern practices like reverse osmosis and things like that, the question is, are any of these perceptions actually true? Is there any foundation to any of them, any of these reasons why people have historically walked past red maple with a roll of tubing and left it out as a crop tree? Um, so what we aim to do in this study was to provide some empirical data to assess those beliefs. So number one, to determine what are the typical total syrup yields from red maples in a given year, um, total syrup yields that is, and also to assess the flavor of syrup produced from red maple sap. And this was a study that was funded by a USDA AMS Acer Access grant um, to the University of Vermont. Um, and definitely thank them for the support for this, uh, which we think is a pretty important piece of work. Um, and overall, the idea is if we could provide um, information to help dispel these beliefs if they're not true, adding red maple for all the reasons that I um, uh, talked about before, adding red maple as a crop tree for people that don't already use it as a crop tree definitively provides a means to increase the over, overall operational yield of a particular operation and also um, to just increase the um, industry at large by opening things, opening areas of red maple production up, especially in areas where, um, where uh, they have not been tapped before. Okay, so the first step in this process, and I'm gonna go through this one a little bit faster because we've talked about it before um, in, in several seminars, but the first step was to determine the total yields from red maple trees. And this is a pretty simple study. Uh, we simply have, uh, we had 10 red maple trees that were healthy, um, co-dominant or dominant, all growing in the same stand. And we had 10 each in each of five different diameter classes. So 10 each, all the way from nine inches all to 19 inches. And then we had sugar maples, also healthy, dominant, co-dominant in the same stand, from the same size classes. Each of them had a separate sap collection chamber like this one. They're all connected to the same vacuum system. They all get new spouts each year and the same tap hole depth. And very simply, they're all tapped at the same time. And then each time there is a sap flow event, uh, the sap in the chamber is measured, both its volume and its sap sugar content. So that for each tree in our study, we can sum up the total yield of uh, produced by that tree and then we can get the average total yield for each of those diameter classes that we're looking at. And we repeated this in two different years, in 2020 and 2021. So first year, 2020 was a very average year, a, a pretty good year uh, in terms of weather for the production season, because it is important to remember always, um, and you'll see, especially this is highlighted in the rest of this study, but. It is important to remember that no matter what we do and what technology we use and everything we throw at everything, that ultimately the yields that we are able to obtain are fully and totally dependent on what mother nature gives us. We are dependent on the number and duration of sap flow events that we have. As many of you in the regions where we're focused on tonight in West Virginia in Ohio and Pennsylvania, you know this better than most other maple producers for sure. But in 2020 in Northern Vermont, it was a pretty good year and a pretty standard year for uh, production for us. And so just to jump into the data here, these are our average yields for each of those diameter classes for red maple. So all the way from again, nine inches up to 19 inches. And you can see pretty clearly that these yields were very good. Our, the average yields, for the smallest trees were over a half gallon of syrup per tap and the biggest trees were over a gallon of syrup per tap. And that might seem like shockingly big, but this is pretty common when we use chambers to study yields because there are no losses in that system. It's extremely vacuum tight. We're collecting every drop of sap. Um, and so there are basically nothing lost in the filter press or on the sugar house floor. Uh, but it is important to, uh, for me to note that 
for any of our yield studies, including this one, we only count the yields uh, into the totals of grade A syrup. So the minute that we start producing commercial syrup or less than grade A syrup in the sugar bush at the Proctor Center, we stop counting the yields into these totals for any of our research studies. So this is all representative of grade A syrup. So pretty good yields for red maple. Obviously, to put this in context, we, we kind of want to know what were the sugar maples in the same stand doing? And you can see here that the uh, yields for the sugar maples in the same five classes in that stand were equal or not significantly different from the red maples. So, and adding them all up, if we just look at the overall average for each species, you can see that not only were they really good yields, but they were also equal. They were not significantly different from one another. Okay, so that's just one season. And when it comes to yield studies in particular, we simply cannot rest on one year because, you know, the old phrase in uh, maple production, which my colleague Mark likes to, to um, often repeat, is that if you've seen one maple season, you've seen one maple season. All of them are different. So it's really important for us to make, before we make any conclusions about something with respect to yields, we need to repeat it more than one time um, and usually more than two times. So um, a few other notes before, um, uh, before I go on to the next year is that in that year, uh, the sap flow stopped in the both species at the same time before buddy flavor ever even developed in our sugar bush. So that actually happened across our sugar bush that year, the sap flow just stopped before we made, made any late season flavored syrup. Um, and we also, because that was uh, COVID and we were short on people for sure, uh, we didn't have the data collection sufficient to look at what the daily sap yields and sugar concentration data were like for the red maple versus the sugar maple. Okay, so 2021, as many of you remember, especially up here in the Northeast, it was a pretty poor year for production, really the worst one on record since I have been at the Proctor Center. Um, the, it was warm, things were buddy, th or uh, sorry, things were ropey, and the sap sugar concentration was extremely low. And I was in complete panic mode because it was a really terrible year to do a study of what's the maximum possible yield that we can get from a red maple tree. But Nonetheless, you don't know that before the season is starting, so we um, have the data that we have. So you can see here in this season, very different than 2020. Basically, once it, it was very, very cold, and once it got warm, it stayed warm, and all, we have very few freeze-ups like after that. And probably that's a, an experience that many of you on the call are very familiar with. It's a pattern that we see more often in the more southern reaches of maple of the maple producing area. Okay, so but here are the yields that we have. You can see that they're essentially the same pattern. You know, there's bigger yields for bigger trees, but the overall yields are much lower. And it was the same for both the red maples and the sugar maples. And so when we look at the overall average, not just, you know, putting all the size classes together for the two species, again, you can see that they're not as good as they were the year before, but they are, again, equal to one another. So no difference between the yields of red and sugar maple. Um, and again, you can see this, basically the overall conclusion with the yields here is that in good years, there was no significant difference in the total yields from these two species. In the years where the yields were very good, they were both equally very good. In the years where the, the, uh, the conditions for production were not so good, the yields were equally not as good. So one thing, um, well, I can just, I'll mention this now instead of later, a really important, like that's a great conclusion and it's really important to find that out but we cannot fully rest on that just there. So yes, by the numbers, these yields are equal, but if some of the beliefs about the flavor of red maple syrup were true, for example, that the sap 
started to make buddy or late season season syrup earlier than sugar maple sap, then we couldn't necessarily in, um, consider these numbers equal to one another because not all of the red maple yield that we counted in the study would count towards grade A syrup. So we, before we can completely say that the yields are the same between the species, we actually need to do the flavor part of the experiment to confirm that all of this counts as grade A syrup. Okay, so that's how we did part two. But before I get there, I just wanted to go through a little bit of the, uh, the sap sugar concentration data and the, the yields across the season, because it also helped to spell some of our thoughts or maybe these myths, if we want to call them, about red maple. So we have to ignore the data in the red boxes. These are times where, um, where we had freezing temperatures and frozen sap in the chambers, which anybody that's ever worked with trying to quantify sap in chambers knows what this is like. So basically, we can't look at the yield data for the, that period. It's a cost of doing business in maple research. You can't win it all. But the important thing that I can show here with respect to yields, um, so this is total syrup yield across the season. And the thing that is evident here is that the pattern between the two species is identical. Basically, the two species are having producing the same yield on the same date, in, like in response to the same freeze-thaw event, they're producing approximately the same amount of syrup. There's, they're not responding differently than one another. They're not behaving differently. And also, as the season ended, they ended the same. So the same, they're uh, ceasing sap flow at the same time, and they're following the same pattern of sap flow across the season. So there's no evidence here that these trees are behaving any differently from one another when they're in the same stand and everything else is equal. So this is important. There's uh, to, to recognize that there's really just, they're not um, behaving any differently than one another. Um, the sap sugar concentration is also kind of interesting. Again, we have to ignore everything in the big red box, which is unfortunate. But if we look here, this is the sap sugar concentration for red maple in the green and sugar maple in the purple. And you can see that as we have always heard or learned, the uh, sap sugar concentration for red maple is slightly lower than sugar maple, but it is not extraordinarily lower. It was often up, um, about 0.2 degrees bricks on average different, which is a pretty small difference. That doesn't mean that every red maple and every sugar maple are 0.2 degrees bricks always different. Um, sometimes there will be bigger differences between individuals, but overall, the difference was often within that range, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4 degrees bricks difference. So not this ginormous difference that we, some of us may have had in our minds, at least I kind of had it in my mind. If there was a difference, it should be pretty big, but it, it wasn't that big. And also in terms of sap flow, again, we don't see ginormous differences. Like, you know, we do often see very big sap flows in red maple that sort of compensate for the slightly lower sap sugar concentration. But on average, those two differences are not that ginormous. Again, we're averaging a lot of trees here, so that makes a lot of sense. But on gross, gross average, a slightly different sap sugar concentration and a slightly different amount of sap, and the two make up for one another in the end. Okay, so the fundamental total yield of syrup from the red maple are very good similar, not significantly different from the total yield of sugar maple, and no indication that red maples are stopping to run earlier than the sugar maples in the same stand. Next up, obviously, like I mentioned before, is to look at the flavor. Um, and we've already talked about some of the reasons, some of these beliefs that we have about the flavor of red maple syrup. So to test these beliefs, and if any of them are true, Simply, all we have to do ha, ha, is produce the syrup simultaneously from pure red maple sap and pure sugar maple sap and compare the flavor and see if it's different <laughs> with all the same conditions, et cetera. So it's a pretty simple experiment. 
um, a little bit difficult to actually achieve, but it is in concept, it's pretty simple. So to do this, we had approximately 500 each sugar and red maple trees growing in the same stands at the Proctor Center. You can see kind of here that we basically, they're all growing the same area and they're flowing into different main lines. They're um, obviously different collection systems, but the same vacuum system and all tapped sim simultaneously. Um, here you can see the tanks that they're co being collected, the two different types of sap are being collected in. So each time we would have a significant enough sap flow event, we would bring these up to the processing research facility at the Proctor Center. And, um, and here you can see the large sap tanks. And actually one of the most interesting and cool things for me that I didn't expect to see at all, because of course you don't see much pure red and pure sugar maple sap together in that kind of quantity at once. I was amazed that you could actually see a difference between the two. I thought that was about the coolest thing since white bread. So that was neat for me. But anyway, once we brought it up to the research facility, we would immediately concentrate it to 8% sugar using reverse osmosis. This is super important because if there is, and there is, a even just a small difference in the sap sugar concentration of the two different types of sap, if we just use raw sap, the, there would be a fundamental and inherent difference in both the time and also the conditions that that sap was processed into syrup. So it would, you know, if it was the lower sap sugar concentration would take longer and everything would kind of flow from there. So the conditions would not be equal. So we needed to concentrate it to uh, the same level in order for the conditions dirt in the evaporator to be equal um, from one to the other. So we did this, we concentrated them sequentially. So uh, with a rinse in between, and of course we would swap the order that we did that in. So if red maple was first one day, it would be second the next day. This is really, really fast. So we have a, a, a well-sized RO for this job so that we can affect that concentration with very little lag time of the other sap sitting, waiting to be concentrate. Uh, concentrated. So there's really a negligible, if any, impact of one sap sitting around or one set of concentrates sitting around longer than the other. We are doing this really fast. Okay. So once we had that, we would have our uh, tanks of concentrated sap. So it concentrated to 8%, the sugar maple and the red maple. Again, still looking different from one another, which I still think is cool. Um, and then simply all we would do would, would be flood the evaporators with their um, uh, designated treatment, start the evaporators simultaneously. And these evaporators are each set up identically to one another. So they have the same uh, same settings, the same sap depths, the same, uh, they have a burner adjustment so that they have exactly the same nozzles and draft and everything, same draw off temperature. And essentially we are allow them to run with those settings the same. And then we collect the syrup separately from each one um, and filter it separately. And we continue that process until the concentrate supply is exhausted from the two. And then we take that syrup that is separate and freeze it for later analyses. And we were able to do this four times during the 22 production season. Okay, so here are our four pairs of syrup. See the red maple on the top and the sugar maple on the bottom. Um, and you can see very importantly that these are all within April. And that April 12th date was after the frogs, the peepers started peeping at the sugar bush or at the proctor center. So this is, a very late season syrup. So very important because this is where part of where we're really interested in, right? We are interested in uh, what one of the questions that people have about red maple syrup or syrup made from red maple sap. One of the beliefs is that they turn, that it turns buddy earlier. So we really wanted to make sure we were making some late season syrup and we were successful at doing that, um, even though it was pretty hot in the sugar house that day. So our big question, I mean, there's tons of things that we are can and will analyze that we want to know about what's the difference between sap, syrup made from pure red maple and pure sugar maple sap. But for this study, what we're really interested in is flavor. And 
There are also a number of ways that we can look at that. I've got all sorts of chemistry to do with some of my colleagues and it'll be really cool. But the simplest and most important way that we can evaluate flavor is using the most powerful sensory evaluation tool that we have, which is the human palate. And so to do this, we do sensory evaluation experiments. And the first thing that we need to do is identify, is there a difference at all between the syrups produced simultaneously with all the same conditions, with only the difference being it was pure red maple or pure sugar maple sap? Is there a difference there at all? If there is a difference found, then we can go further to see and investigate what is the nature of that difference. But until there's not, a, until we find a difference, we don't go exploring for what difference there could be. We have to identify that there is a difference there first. And the way that we do this is with a standard sensory evaluation tool called a triangle test. And it is designed to answer that question. And it's a very cool, very simple methodology uh, basically for each sensory panelist that participates, they get a set of these three samples in these opaque bottles so that they cannot see anything about the syrup, which is really important. And they each have a random three digit code. And basically say, for example, you, we had the pair of syrup produced on April 4th and we wanted to test, is there a difference between them? Well, some panelists would get, each panelist would get two of one and one of the other, but some might get a red maple, a sugar maple, a red maple, some would get sugar, sugar, red, and basically two of one and one of the other in all different orders. And all the panelists have to do is taste the three and identify which one is different from the other two. So it's very much like one of these things is not like the other. Um, and actually for those of you that are on the, uh, in the seminar tonight that have participated, you can attest that this is actually kind of mind boggling to do because once you take your eyes away, it's really difficult. Like you realize how much you taste with your eyes. Um, but anyway, we repeat this. And what we did for this study was we took our two syrup pairs at the end. So we took the pair of syrups that we produced at the very beginning and that very last one as the frogs were peeping in the background, that late season syrup. And we ran triangle tests for each one of them to, de to determine if there's a difference. So we had 22 healthy uh, non-smokers familiar with tasting pure maple syrup, because obviously for even for uh, a foodie, tasting this much syrup in a row, even though it's only six samples, can be a lot. Um, so we really have to make sure that we're we have people that are used to tasting syrup a little bit. Um, and so for there to be a moderately significant difference, 12 of those 22 panelists had to correctly get the, the odd sample of the trio. And for it to be very significant, 14 of the 22 had to get it right. So here are the results. So for the sample on April 4th, our first sample, 13 panelists correctly identified the odd sample. And that's just in between something that we would consider it's, it is significant, but it's not at that very significant level. So there's definitely an indication that there is a difference in flavor there, but it is not a ginormous difference. It was not at a very significant level. But perhaps more importantly is the fact that only nine panelists got the correct, uh, identified the odd sample correctly in the pair of syrups produced on that late season, April 12th date. This suggests not only is there not a difference, but because they were late season, it suggests that there is no difference in the tendency for red maple sap to produce late season syrup any different than uh, sugar maple sap. So this is very indicative that there is not this predisposition or predilection for making, for red maple sap to make that late season syrup earlier. So um, this is a really interesting result. This part, the, the late season one is very important. And for this, the early one where we did detect a difference, now we go further to see 
what is the nature of that difference? And we're doing this through a chemical analysis of volatile flavor and aroma compounds that should help us detect what is the nature of that difference. Um, and I can tell you non-objectively because I'm the one that ran the study. So I have like zero objectivity in the flavor, but I can, the best I can do is say that there is definitely a difference there, but it is very subtle. Um, so I'm looking forward, working with my colleagues to work on what compounds um, and uh, are different between the two and we'll report on that in the future. So in terms of myth busting for red maple, sap yields are equally as good as sugar maple when we're using conditions of vacuum, good sanitation. And we have for syrup flavor, maybe a little bit of subtle difference in that early season sample, but no, incre no evidence of increased occurrence of late season off flavor. So uh, the general conclusion is that especially under vacuum, there's no reason to pass by a healthy uh, red maple with a roll of tubing. And so before I open it up to questions, I just wanted to mention a couple of things that are specific to red maple because red maple, as equal as I have just shown them to be in terms of yields and somewhat with respect to flavor, they are not the same tree as a sugar maple. Um, so there's some other factors to consider when using them as a crop tree. One of them is the tendency to sometimes have these very large central columns of discolored or non-conductive wood. So this means that especially for trees in an area where you are pretty sure that they have this phenotype, this characteristic, that there should be some caution with the tapping depth you use for red maple. And perhaps this trees with these phenotype, this characteristic, you can see there's not a whole lot of conductive sap wood there. So it may be that trees with this characteristic could have lower yields than a similarly sized sugar maple with fully conductive sapwood or even a similarly sized red maple with more conductive sapwood. So that's something to consider. Um, also, just you know, for what it's worth, when we talk about red maples, kind of uh, people talk about them budding out earlier or turning buddy earlier. One of the reasons for this is that we see the floral buds of maple, of, of red maple, um, sort of starting to get active first. These are floral buds that we see. And this may be a distinction without a difference, but it is true. It's the floral buds. The vegetative buds of red maple actually open and develop slightly later than sugar maple. So fun fact to know and tell. Okay, and when it comes to the size of uh, non-conductive wood columns from tap hole wounds in red maple, this is also very important. Um, a study done by my former colleague, Tim Wilmot at UVM Extension, found that tap holes drilled into clean, sort of clear conductive sapwood in red maple were similar in their size uh, to as sugar maple. So that was pretty interesting. However, there is, in large part because red maples have that tendency to form that large central column of uh, this colored wood. And they can also have some pretty um, uh, significant staining from early branches that have broken off. Um, and, you know, red maple, we call it soft maple for a reason. It breaks. <laughs> it's, um, so it tends to have a lot of branch scars. And actually, you can see back in uh, this picture, you can see that when red maples start off their life, I'm pointing and you're not seeing, sorry. When red maples start off their life in a multiple stem format, which is how many of them start, when that those early stems die off, that can leave a lot of non-conductive wood and a lot of it becomes that central column. So there is a tendency for red maples to have a pretty substantial amount of non-conductive wood already in there. So there may be, especially with some particular red maples, a higher chance of hitting an area of previous existing non-conductive wood with a new tap hole, such as what's happened here. And when that happens, it really can generate a large amount of non-conductive wood in response to that. And one other thing, really cool thing that Tim found was that those bark fissures that we often see in red maples with that smooth bark, 
are generally superficial. So they did not uh, uh, translate into a larger wound internally to the tree when he finally, when he dissected them. And just something else to consider, again, red maple is not a sugar maple. They have a totally different lifespan. They're much shorter lived. And we've already talked about how they respond differently to different environmental conditions, different growing habits. So in terms of regeneration and sort of thinking the long-term, red maple and uh, ensuring that red maple um, uh, continues you know, sort of the long-term sugar bush planting is going to require different uh, different management practices. And also having red maple, they are breaky. So if you have a lot of red maple, you can end up doing, you know, having a, um, some people with a lot of red maples report having more woods work in their areas with more red maple. So that is something to consider as well. And giant thank yous to a lot of people that helped with this research in a variety of ways. Um, and I think uh, that was a lot of talking and I'm gonna stop now and open it up for some questions. Hey folks, just as a reminder, if you have uh, questions for Dr. Vandenberg, please throw them in the chat or the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. That would be great. Quiet audience. I've said everything. There are no more things. I know. I was about to say you might have stumped them. <laughs> Everyone is just asleep. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, here you go. You got a... Uh... I didn't see New York in the first slides in regards to red maple. Was it included? Oh, yes, definitely. Especially because Mike is from New York. <laughs> Hang on. Let me get to back to that slide. So here you go. New York is down here with a sizable and bigger uh, um, potential untapped red maple resource than its sugar maple resource. Lot of red maple in New York to be tapped. Um, you got one from one of our folks in West Virginia. The red maple syrup looked a little darker in the sample bottles. Was that the case? No, not really. It's kind of a, it's a really hard to take that picture with everything perfect. <laughs> so, um, there was no difference in the color. And I'm looking at one from Richard. In the flavor difference, was there a preference between syrup made with red or sugars? And Richard, we didn't, and we at this different kind of test, and we did not ask that question. We were just looking for a difference. But it would be fun to do a preference test. If for so you technically you're only supposed to do those tests after you found the difference. So you can't ask if someone prefers something until you identify there is a difference. So we could potentially run that with the, the April 4th sample. Nice. <laughs> uh, Joel says, I'm more than ever happy that I tap my red maples. <laughs> sample size of one. <laughs> Thank you, David. I appreciate that a lot. Mm -hmm. Do you think you're going to extend to any other varieties of maple? Probably not. Uh, not at the Proctor Center anyway, because we don't have a huge resource of tappable size um, any other maple. Like 15 years ago, I proposed to do a study to tap sapling-sized striped maples because they make some pretty tasty syrup. 
And we have lots of those and we have the technology to be able to collect that from saplings, but um, I, I, it didn't get funded, so we never did it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it'll be, it's definitely there. I think it would be very valuable to do some other big commercial scale, sap, especially flavor experiments with other species like silver maples. Well, I mean, like at Ohio State, they're doing um, work on the, the reds and the real verse, the, the hybrids between the two, which will be really interesting. But we don't have a lot of that like really good side by side, everything the same in commercial maple equipment um, studies and comparisons of different types of maple to see what the flavor is like. So things like box elder and um, silver maple, which is popular and, and abundant in some places. Um, we tend to have just like anecdotal data of like someone that's got like a bunch of Norways in their yard. <laughs> you yeah. just, you know, you can't, you can't make the same conclusions as you can when it was made, you know, with the same conditions in an evaporator using that commercial equipment. Absolutely. Uh, you have one from one of our West Virginia folks again. Was the late sap you made red maple syrup from produced from floral budded trees or no? That is an excellent question, Cody. And I wish uh, my trusty right hand, Brendan, was here to, <laughs> to, to hear you ask that because I was sending him out every single day with the spotting scope to see uh, what the buds were doing while we were making that syrup. And there was some development, but not a huge amount, but they had definitely started. The action was started for sure. So that was also kind of interesting. And thank you. Brendan will be so happy that that work was not in vain. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. And I'm seeing David's question about any thoughts on beech tree syrup. That is a really cool question. So about this, about the same time, about 15 years ago, it was like 2014, no, 2010. It was a long time ago when we, uh, when Tim and I first developed the technique of cutting off the saplings, and we totally developed that as a complete accident while we were trying to do a different experiment. We were looking at something else and then discovered that you could collect a lot of sap from a maple tree if you cut the top off of it. And so once we discovered that we could do that, we we're like, wow, that means that you could collect that from just about anything. <laughs> so we went out and we collected sap from literally every species of tree that was growing at the Proctor Center and made syrup from it, a small amount. And let me tell you, there was some really gnarly syrup that you would never want to taste. But the beach syrup that we made at that time in like 2010 was amazing. And so, yeah, not a very big sample size from us, but, you know, it does have, the, when we made it, it was very good. Other people have subsequently done some more work with it and also found that it's pretty good or a taste that other people like it. So, um, in, you know, in my work with it, I really liked it. Same with the striped maple was, like I said, was also very good. But you have to, with beech, it's really, there's not the kind of pressure development that you get with maple. And so you must have vacuum in order to get any kind of sap yield. And the sap sugar content is very, very low. You've got a question about floral buds again. Um, I'm finding the production on my reds that are budding flowers drastically drops very quickly. Do you have any data on sap production post floral bud? Cody, I'm gonna have to get back to you on that because Brendan was also out there with the spotting scope during the sap yield experiment. I don't think we made it very much past that point in the two years of the yield study because the sap yield in both the sap uh, flow in that year, both years stopped. Um, it didn't just kind of taper off, it just stopped. Um, so 
send me an email if you think about it. And I will remember to look at what the bud level was, what the bud development level was when we were doing that, but I don't think it was much. Are there any other questions floating out there? Oh, thank you, Keith. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you, everyone. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, I uh, don't be shy. Feel free to reach out. We're always interested in hearing ideas and questions like it's questions from you all uh, that help us kind of think sometimes you know and get our wheels turning about what the next studies need to be done and what are important things to know and find out so um yeah thanks for having me and and don't be strangers mm. Thank you so much, uh, Abby. We really appreciate you kicking off our Maple Madness weekend here in West Virginia. For those of you who are West Virginia res residents um, and people close enough to commute in, uh, tomorrow we will be at Jackson's Mill doing a sanitation and tubing workshop. And then the day after is the West Virginia annual um, Maple Syrup Producers Association meeting. Um, if you are a West Virginia syrup producer and have not signed up, uh, it's not too late. You can still come, um, but try to get in touch with one of us, one of us to let us know that you will be there. Um, otherwise, Lindsay, am I missing anything? I'm going to go ahead and launch our exit poll where you can tell us what you thought of the webinar. Helps us know uh, where we should go in the future with these. Um, if you don't have something to do this weekend, there's lots going on. There is a forest farming field day happening at... Um, the U Mountain um, Center, you can head out there. Um, like Kate said, the West Virginia uh, Maple Syrup Producers Association annual meeting. Oh, um, and I, I forgot my own event. Um, on Sunday at the U Mountain Center, I'm teaching a woodlot assessment workshop. So if you are in West Virginia and are near the Pocahontas County area, U Mountain Center is hosting a woodlot assessment um, specifically for maple workshop. Um, on Sunday. Yes, um, that was going to be my other reminder. So yeah, please go to one of the events. There's some really cool things happening this weekend um, in West Virginia. Well, thank you all so much for attending, um, and I hope everybody has a great weekend. Yeah, have a great uh, uh, annual meeting. I wish I was there in person. <laughs> You're going to have to stop having it the same weekend as the Quebec Open Houses. Well, we'll try to convince folks of that. Maybe we'll. <laughs> <laughs> there might be a tough sell. Yeah, maybe we'll just have to figure out a way to get some West Virginians up to the Quebec Open Houses. There you go. There you go. Good night, everybody. Thank you for coming. Thanks, Abby.